morning, everyone. Uh, I, too, want to thank uh, uh, Michael and Karen and Adam and all of the staff of the Hamilton Project for once again uh, conceiving what I think will be a, uh, an important and extraordinarily timely uh, discussion here this morning. Now, the, the stated topic for this panel is, uh, quote, the state of the budget, unquote. Uh, Jimmy Fallon probably would like that. Uh, but we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have with us, uh, as, as Bob said in his introdu introduction, uh, an extraordinarily uh, talented and experienced group of panelists. I don't think we could possibly have a better one. Uh, and I'm going to focus this discussion to the best of my ability on, at least for the beginning of the discussion, on two aspects of the budget that I hope are as timely as they could possibly be. One is the sequester, and the other is the uh, recent and possibly quite profound change in the cost curve involving health cost inflation and the implications of that on the federal budget. But let's start with the issue of the moment, the sequester. And I just want to begin by saying this. Um, the present moment in Washington, this moment, perhaps better illustrates the uniqueness or the sui generis nature of Washington itself than any moment I can remember over many years. I was sitting in a cab this morning coming in from the airport uh, and, the, and the cab driver was listening to CNN radio. And just as I settled into the back, uh, the CNN host said, now we're going to talk about the only issue that anybody is talking about here in Washington today, sequestration. And I thought to myself, imagine someone living in Asia, a very aware and uh, uh, worldly person, who, but not a political junkie, who's on a business trip to the United States, comes to Washington, gets into that same cab, and hears that word. Uh, imagine how confused that person would be. Wait, did the CNN host say defenestration? <laughs> oh, no, no, that was reforestation. <laughs> Only in Washington. Uh, but it is important. So I I'm going to try to ask some questions here, which frame this in a particular way, and I hope a helpful way. Uh, and let me start with, with, with two that just hopefully put it in some, in some perspective. One is the history in terms of how we are dealing now with, with, with the idea of a sequester um, and uh, the degree to which Actually, if, unless you correct me, it's not a brand new idea. And the second is the real size over the short term of the impacts of the sequester. So maybe I could start with Alice. Uh, I'd like to say, Alice, I've enjoyed working with you so much over so many years, and I'm really happy to be here with you. Uh, give us some sense of how the whole idea of sequester evolved over the past 10 or 20 or 25 years, because in doing some research recently and in connection with this event, uh, I learned that no, it's not a new idea, even though a lot of people think it is. So can, can you give us some sense of that? Yes, but not very long, because it really doesn't matter how we got here, we shouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, back in the 1980s, when uh, the Congress and the President were struggling with what seemed like large budget deficits, at the time, and were by the standards of the time, though we've dwarfed them since, uh, the Congress uh, realized that it wasn't getting the job done, that it uh, really had to find some way of compromising uh, between the forces that uh, wanted to keep taxes low and the forces that uh, wanted to cut spending. and. Uh, uh, they had a standoff, uh, not too certain, unlike what we have now. Uh, they passed something called the Graham-Rudman-Hollings Law, which was a rather bizarre piece of legislation 
uh, and it said uh, we will agree on a uh, deficit path, and if we don't get there, we will uh, cut across the board uh, all uh, except certain exempt uh, spending. And um, that will force us to come to agreement because it's so obviously stupid to, cr to cut across the board uh, that we will uh, come to uh, some kind of agreement. It was a badly designed law, as we found out later uh, when we designed a better one in the Budget Act of uh, 1990. Uh, but it did come to, into effect, uh, I think only once. Uh, uh, but at a very small amount. They did a very tiny uh, sequester uh, one year, but then decided quite wisely uh, in 1990 that there were better ways of controlling uh, the, uh, the deficit. Uh, but, weren't the, but weren't the budget, uh, the budget controls during the Clinton years, which we all know, among many other things, contributed to the best fiscal period we've had in 60 years, weren't the caps on the discretionary side in those years backed up, at least in theory, by a sequester so that if the discretionary account effectively exceeded the, the, the caps, a sequester would kick in. My point in bringing all this up yeah. really is that, it, that it's historically, I think, been used as an enforcement mechanism. It's just been used in a small, tiny way or, or just on the shelf, and now we're being faced with it in a big way and perhaps a live way. Uh, that's right. I think that that's really enough said on the on the history. Uh, okay, the, so let's yeah. turn let's turn to the size. So Bob Reichar, let me ask you. So, well, I want to say something about the history, uh, <laughs> be, because okay. Okay. Um, I, I, as a mechanism that stimulates more rational action, there have been points where it has been important, and uh, in uh, 1990. Uh, when uh, the Congress and the President couldn't agree, uh, we had looming before us a 30-odd uh, percent cut in domestic discretionary and a 34 percent in non-armed uh, uh, service personnel cut in defense, which stimulated the 1990 agreement. Okay. Let me ask about the size. So the number that we hear about or read about every few minutes is, is, the, is 85 billion uh, as it relates to the remainder of, the, of this federal fiscal year through September 30. Uh, but I have the impression, as usual, that there, I mean, I, I, I have the impression that as, as usual there's, a, there's an important distinction between budget authority and appropriations. So let's just talk about that. What is the uh, 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 impact of the sequester if it took effect and stayed on the books for the rest of this fiscal year on, on the appropriations side, and is that or isn't that really the right way, at least over this next few months, to think about the real dollar impact? Well, <clears throat> it's a reduction of $85 billion in budgetary resources, budget authority, which is uh, giving, through an appropriation bill, the agencies of government the legal ability to enter into contracts and commitments to spend money. It isn't the spending. Uh, the spending, you know, the, the shipbuilding account in the Navy might be cut uh, by close to 8%, but that means the Navy can't sign contracts uh, except uh, those that would fit into the smaller budget. It would be spent out over a number of years in that account. Uh, in a personnel account, it will be spent out almost all within the current fiscal year. So of the $85 billion in reduced uh, budgetary authority, uh, only about $45 billion would be seen in reduced outlays, actual spending. And it's, of course, actual spending that affects the economy most directly. Okay, so is it correct, Bob, then to say that the fiscal 13 impact of the sequester, if it took effect and stayed there, uh, from a GDP point of view, for example, is really the $45 billion number, not the $85 billion number. Well, it is and it isn't because, of course, in anticipation of work that uh, the contractor might expect to get in 2014, they're going to be uh, reducing their labor force, maybe, uh, and so there'll be some anticipatory uh, reduction as well. 
the rest of that $85 billion that isn't spent in the current year will be spent, obviously, uh, in fiscal 2014, which begins, after all, in October. So from a calendar standpoint, you know, the number will be higher than the 44 or $45 billion. In fact, there's some reason to think that some of that anticipation has already, already happened. happened. All right, well, that leads to a related question, which I must say I hear a fair amount, uh, although you wouldn't probably hear it in a room like this or maybe much in Washington, but you do hear it elsewhere in the country. And I'll just rely, I'll just take what Bob just said and use it as the basis for the question, which is if some figure like 45 billion is the uh, impact for the rest of this federal fiscal year over the next seven months, since the budget is 3.6 trillion and we have a roughly 15 trillion dollar economy, you hear so many people around the country say, why is that such a big deal? Uh, why can't we, even if it is across the board, uh, uh, live with a reduction which is so small? So Donald, let me ask you that. Sure, well I mean the first is it's an incredibly blunt instrument. Right, so there's no thought that's going into this. This is purely a mechanical across the board thing and so you're gonna be cutting things you like and cutting things where there's, there's room to trim some fat. And you know, in a better world, we would have policymakers who are focused on actually making policy choices rather than just incredibly blunt arithmetic. Uh, the other is from a macro point of view, we have this very hard issue. Uh, we still have a weak economy. We have a certain amount of withdrawal of stimulus already this year, right? The payroll tax cut has expired. Taxes have gone up at the high end. We've had some spending reductions. And so from a macro point of view, we've already done a certain amount of reducing the deficit, making progress on that front. And you don't want to do that too fast, right? You want to spread it out over time. And so there's a very serious question about, you know, whether now is the time to do more. But if you were doing a town hall meeting today in some other part of the country, and the question from the audience was, I appreciate your point on macroeconomics and fiscal drag, but just from a broader point of view, since a very high majority of Americans think that it would be a good idea if the federal government spent less, not more, why is this amount, putting aside macroeconomics and fiscal drag, why is this amount, the 45 billion to pick a number, uh, such a hard thing to do? Uh, leaving aside the desirability of the way we're cutting it, I understand all that. But if, if you were in a town hall meeting, you would get a question like that, I'm pretty sure. So how would you answer that? So the first is I think, I think we're actually on a trajectory where it may be relatively easy to do because it requires Congress to do nothing, kind of in, in practical terms. Uh, which I don't mean that quite as cynically as it sounded. Uh, what's the right way to answer that? So there's, if you go by what people will ask in the town hall meetings and what the polling data tell us, they will suggest that American people have an appreciation that we have a significant deficit problem in the long run and that it may make sense in the abstract to reduce some spending. But then if you go down the list of things, right, you discover that they're actually fans of the vast majority of them. Right? And so the 45 billion, which becomes 85 billion, which then, remember, this then starts again, this sequester is part of a $1 trillion set of cuts over, over nine years. Uh, those, you know, those are going to be things that are showing up in defense accounts that people appreciate uh, in the town halls and the places that have people who work for defense establishments. Uh, there'll be ones that affect Medicare, there'll be ones that affect unemployment insurance, a whole host of things that people care about. Well, I think this little discussion illustrates the part of the problem uh, from a broad political point of view, which is that on the one hand, the American public seem to think, as you said, that not only do we have a deficit problem, but spending is a big part of that problem and that we need to curb spending. On the other hand, as you say, when you, talk, when you get to specifics, they really like the national parks, they really like meat inspections, they really like air traffic controllers and so forth. Uh, all right, let's turn to possible solutions, ways out of this thing. Uh, and Alice, I'm gonna come back and ask you this. Um, the administration's position is, uh, the sequester, as you put it, is stupid. Uh, we should, uh, uh, not let it take effect, we should substitute for it a balanced package of revenue raising actions on the one hand and reductions in the area of spending, which actually is the problem, namely mandatory spending, on the other hand, or entitlements. 
and here's my question. Uh, I, I'll reveal my bias. I think that is a reasonable position that the administration has. But I worry about implementing it as follows. And any, uh, each of you, I hope, might comment on this. Uh, the most popular area of discussion, I, maybe I can put it that way, on the revenue side is re various types of reforms. For example, reforming deductions. Now, it's been uh, about 35 years since I first came to Washington to work. And over that period, the only time I've seen reforms, revenue, uh, re tax reforms, they've taken a long time to do. Most notably the 86 Tax Act, but in general. So is it really feasible, I hope, I hope I'm wrong on this, is it really feasible to rather quickly do a package of entitlement reform on the one hand and some type of tax reform on the other or some type of revenue raising actions which doesn't involve higher marginal tax rates again. Is that possible? Yes, I think it's possible. Uh, let me just build on Donald's answer about why the sequester is a bad uh, idea. It's just not, not only it's a bad time to cut uh, uh, anything when uh, we've got a drag on the uh, uh, budget from coming from the budget anyway uh, but uh, we've already cut the range of programs that are at issue here the discretionary spending the sequester falls mainly on discretionary spending that has been cut already so that it's on a track uh, to give us less discretionary spending in relation to uh, the size of the economy than we have had in many decades. And yeah, about I, 50 years. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that seems to me important. So we're cutting the wrong things. And what's driving the uh, deficits uh, that we see looming in the next decade uh, is entitlements and the fact that we aren't raising enough revenue. Uh, but uh, to come to your question, We've now spent several years and on commissions and gangs of this Including and that, your commission. Uh, including <laughs> including uh, Simpson Bowles, which I was on, and the uh, Rivlin de Medici, Medici. Rivlin and the gang of six. They've all said the same thing, that you have to, to uh, raise more revenue and have entitlement reform. And they have made proposals, very specific proposals, uh, so we have a whole library of proposals that people have thought about and even put into legislative language. They don't have to take effect right away, because uh, as we said, the deficit's coming down for the next several years. Uh, but we do need to put some things in effect that will, uh, in, in place that will take effect in uh, the next uh, uh, part of the decade. Um, and some of them are fairly simple. Uh, Bob Rubin referred to a conservative economist. I had a conversation with a conservative economist, uh, namely Marty Feldstein, uh, this week. Uh, Marty's got quite a good uh, proposal. I think it wouldn't be my first choice on tax reform, but it would be a strong second. It's very simple. Um, it is cap the deductions and exclusions and other special provisions uh, in the tax code. And you could do that with very simple language and it would be quite progressive as Marty has uh, uh, deducted it, uh, uh, described it, and it would raise quite a lot of revenue. Um, I think if you could get agreement that that's a good thing to do and there's some support on both sides of the aisle, it's not hard. All right, let me ask Bob Reich I'm going to sharpen my question. And, and I, I hope this is an important question because the sequester is going to take effect any minute. And uh, if, we're, if we're going to push toward a substitute for it, it needs to be a substitute that is practical. So sharpening my question, is it really legislatable now under, the, under today's, right, now, right here and now circumstances in Washington and in the Congress? say, Marty Felstein's idea or some version of it. Is that actually legislatable over the next two, three, four months? I'm skeptical, but I hope you're right and I'm wrong. Uh, first, let the record show that I haven't spoken to a conservative economist for over a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you might want to treat my answer uh, 
as an unbalanced one. Don't feel bad, Bob. Alan is, Alice and Bob undoubtedly spoke to the same one. <laughs> um, Marty's idea, which uh, I have some sympathy for, uh, is politically infeasible in the current climate uh, because while many of us in this room would say there's very little difference between spending outlays uh, for various programs and tax expenditures which provide the equivalent uh, kind of benefit but simply by lowering your tax liability uh, you know to uh, most uh, Republicans in Congress uh, they would look at Marty's plan and say, look, uh, this is uh, all taxes. Uh, and we dealt with taxes back with the fiscal cliff negotiation. That's really off the table. Uh, I don't have much sympathy for that argument, but that is the state of play now. The other thing people should remember, and, and it's important for your question, uh, is that we're looking for a solution to uh, an $85 billion sequester, and we're looking, and we can say that solutions that offset that or can substitute for that uh, can happen over a 10 year period. Uh, nothing really has to happen. Uh, now, we keep, uh, when we come up to these immediate uh, crises, we look for ways to cobble together the same amount of deficit reduction, but we look at that over a 10-year period for a hit that's going to occur in a seven-month period. Uh, and so, in a sense, the solution is easier. There are packages of uh, changes to Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, there are little uh, adjustments that uh, can be made in lower priority discretionary spending, maybe. Uh, but they would be phased in over a 10-year period. Uh, so I think the practicality is there, but the political environment is not. So I'll turn to you, Donald. So what is a version of the administration's position, entitlement reductions more or less equally matched with revenue raising actions, that um, is legislatable? over the near to medium term. And in particular, is there some type of tax reform, assuming it's balanced on, with some equal amount of spending, which, which one could envision actually doing now? And I'm asking this question because right. I'm, I'm just skeptical. I don't see it. Right, so I, don't, I, I personally don't know where the deal is to be done. Uh, and I think, as Bob was saying, I think the pressures to do short-term things that defer the problem but leave it unresolved are large. Uh, in principle, what you would want is a not an $85 billion deal, but a trillion dollar deal to deal with the sequester in its entirety. That might include some scheduled discretionary cuts, but it would be an articulated plan. Uh, on tax reform, as, as Alice and Bob said, there's a lot of interest, particularly on the right, uh, about ideas of capping deductions, going after the moral equivalent of spending in the tax code. Uh, I think that is a good place to go fishing, and I think that's ultimately where, if, if a revenue increasing deal is to be done, that's the place to do it. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind, though, and to distinguish things that are good ideas as budget policy from things that are good ideas as tax policy. Uh, I think the idea of capping deductions makes a lot of sense as a budget policy to, if you want more revenue, to go looking for it there. As tax reform, it's atrocious. Uh, it's a goofy, arbitrary policy that says, you know, charitable deductions should be less valuable to someone who lives in a state with high state and local taxes than someone who lives in a state with low state and local taxes. Uh, charitable deductions should be less valuable to someone who has a big mortgage than someone who has a small mortgage. It makes absolutely no sense as tax reform. And the kind of tax reform I think you have in mind is something that would require a longer process to go through the individual components of the code and ask ourselves, as people in later panels today will, you know, what do you want the mortgage interest deduction to look like or support for housing? What do you want savings incentives to look like? And go through it one by one, and that's not something that can be done on a sequester-like timeline. You want to comment any further? Well, Bob's going to laugh because he knows I'm the traditional optimist, and it's hard to be optimistic at the moment. 
But I think these continual conversations about why everything is impossible uh, are, <laughs> are actually not terribly helpful. Uh, the, uh, I sense among Republicans, actually, uh, that there is a lot of cutting fatigue uh, and uh, that there, if given a graceful way to get back to the real issue, as you put it earlier, uh, and uh, hammer out some entitlement reforms that don't take effect right away, uh, but uh, that actually uh, change the trajectory in the long-term future, you might get some takers, and I, I would advise the president, get everybody back to Camp David, uh, stop the blame game, and let's talk about what we really want to do for the economy over uh, the next few years, and it might actually work. All right, let me ask about one, this is the last, last, last question on the sequester before we change the subject. One particular idea that I've heard about, which seems to me to be reasonable, but that must be why it can't happen. Uh, <laughs> And that is this. Take the $85 billion budget authority number, Bob, we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, why couldn't you just say, uh, apropos of the discussion we've been having in macroeconomic theory and fiscal drag and so forth, let's just stretch that out. Let's buy seven months to give the two sides more time to try to work on a longer term deal. Term deal. And the remaining life of the sequester, I believe, is nine years. Why don't we just take that $85 billion of cuts in discretionary and make it $9 billion a year for nine years, or nine plus billion a year for nine years. So stretch out the 2013 piece, uh, the impact on the economy, therefore, and the impact on everybody's favorite, uh, favorite department would be very small, and you would still retain the total amount of deficit reduction, but you'd buy a lot of time. What is wrong with that? Why can't we do that? You know, that would be kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we would then be faced with trying to figure out what the 2014 appropriation bill looked like, and uh, people would balk at that, and we would have a situation, as we have in the defense uh, budget this year, for the continuing resolution, where more was appropriated than uh, would fit under the caps that we were, that we're under. Uh, Alice already mentioned this, uh, and I will say it in a stronger way, that uh, <coughs> Most of the deficit reduction that has occurred so far, which is about $2.7 trillion, uh, a full 69% including, including the it, sequester or excluding it? This is the actions taken over the last two or three years, which we have said, well, we've done part of the job already. And it, uh, you know, there was the tax increase, and there were the uh, discretionary spending caps and the sequester and it sums to around $2.7 trillion. Including the sequester. Yeah. yeah. And of that, about 69% is lowered caps on discretionary spending, uh, which uh, you know, really is a promise to take hard action in the future. It's not something that we can pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, we've done. So we should look and say, well, uh, are these promises we've made realistic? Uh, and the answer is they aren't. There's, you know, very, very little probability that uh, in 2021, when these caps run their course, uh, we will have achieved them. And I'll just give you a few numbers here. Uh, the defense uh, cap as a percent of GDP is 2.8%. The non-defense is also 2.8%. Over the last 50 years, uh, the range for defense, uh, the low point, has been 3%. So we're below any year we've had in the last 50 years. Uh, for non-defense, the 2.8% compares to the low point in the last 50-year range of 3.4% of GDP. In other words, we're shooting for targets that we have absolutely no uh, track record of coming close to. Uh, and, you know, what this suggests is maybe we won't uh, be able to achieve even that uh, deficit reduction that we have already taken credit for. 
nor should we come close to it if we no, want I, to I, run I, a sensible I, government. I couldn't agree <laughs> with you more, but this yeah. is supposedly the law of the land, yeah. and it is backed up by a series of sequesters. And you know, then you'll come along and say, well, why don't we take that, which we haven't been able to do this year, and spread it out over the next uh, X years. And you know, what we're doing is simply kicking the can down the road. But that's the argument for coming back to entitlements and taxes. I agree with you. As you know. Yes. OK, I'd like to, uh, to, to change the subject a little bit. Uh, Having resolved that one. <laughs> uh, well, this is, this is, as you'll see, this is related. Uh, uh, it's really related. Uh, and it's this. Over the past three, four, or five months, something like that, it's emerged that the long-standing trend of health care of health care costs <coughs> rising exponentially faster than broader costs throughout our economy uh, has changed. There's been a dramatic drop-off in the rate of cost increase uh, in a way that I think it's fair to say was almost entirely unforeseen. Uh, in fact, it's caused, as you all know better than I do, you're all former CBO directors, it's caused uh, already big changes in CBO's long-term deficit estimates, and in particular, estimates of the, the, the long-term uh, curve, so to speak, in Medicare costs. So much so that if I'm right, I think I am, um, the targets for Medicare cuts that the Simpson-Bowles Commission, and Alice, you said on it, uh, set in December 2010 for Medicare reductions is going to be exceeded without any policy changes. Uh, in other words, the Simpson-Bowles Commission said, if I'm right, we need to reduce Medicare costs and the target for the amounts we should be spending in future years is this, and now we're on track to actually spend even less than that, even though there's been no in change the in policy. In the first 10 years. Yeah, even though there's been no change in policy. So this gives rise to a series of, of pretty obvious questions, because this could be a very profound development. First, is it a blip, or do we think, or is this a really long-term trend? Um, is this essentially a cycl cyclical response, or is it really a secular development? Uh, what role is the private sector having in this, as so many employers are moving toward some form of defined contribution approach to uh, the health care coverage they provide their employees, and I could ask some others. Let's just take those on. So, Donald, let me start with you. Do you think this is a blip, or do you think this is a real, is, this is a sea change? So whatever Bob has to say, I will trust. He's been following the numbers closer than me. I, you know, if you look at the history of this, you see blips that, uh, that persist for a few years and then go away. Uh, I, my sense is that some of it's real, but my sense is really one of the key lessons here is about the uncertainty in all of these projections. Uh, this is not something that Washington deals particularly well with, right? They like 10-year projections that have things down to the penny, uh, or actually the billion dollars, which is the, <laughs> the penny here in Washington, uh, and like to plan for that kind of certainty, and we engage in budget exercises that assume we know all of that, but we have to really grapple with the fact that there's uncertainty. Uh, the good news is the recent uncertainty seems to be, to be giving to, to making our lives easier on the budget front, but we should also keep in mind that sometimes it goes the other way. What do you think, Alice? Like Donald, I'd like to defer to, to, to Bob uh, on well, then we the can, numbers, we can. Uh, but I think uh, whatever the mix, and it's clearly a mix, of uh, cyclical effects and uh, more serious reform, um, it can't encourage us to say, oh, we fixed it, uh, health care is all right now, uh, there's no problem. Uh, we got plenty of evidence that there's a lot of waste in our system, uh, that our uh, incentives and the way we incent providers are uh, counterproductive, uh, and uh, we ought to uh, continue with what is a very profound set of changes that are already happening in the public and the private sector. Well, Bob, apparently everybody's waiting breathlessly. <laughs> we've, we've heard him well, do this spiel before. <laughs> um, first of all, the slowdown, as you pointed out, has been going on for four or five years. Uh, it undoubtedly was triggered by the uh, you know, economic uh, 
problems we had. Many people uh, lost their jobs, and with that loss of jobs, they lost their health insurance. Uh, in fact, uh, between 2008 and 2011, the number of people with employer-sponsored policies fell by over 11 million, dollar, uh, million people. Uh, Medicaid rolls expanded by about 7 million, but employer-sponsored coverage is expensive. Medicaid for able-bodied people is relatively cheap. Uh, there was an increase of about 7 million in uh, the uninsured. Uh, so sort of there's no question why initially uh, healthcare spending goes down. People didn't have the kind of coverage they had before. Uh, at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, there is a transformation going on within employer-sponsored coverage, uh, and uh, there's been a rather substantial increase in people uh, having uh, high deductible uh, plans, uh, which put more of their skin in the game and probably dampen the uh, desire for uh, uh, spending on, on uh, health care. Uh, this necessarily doesn't uh, explain why Medicare, Medicare has slowed down, uh, but if you look at what happened to the elderly population, uh, they went without a COLA for a couple of years. Uh, their house values, assets, and everything probably uh, declined along with uh, those of the uh, non-elderly population, making them sort of uh, less uh, willing to uh, get health care where they had to pay the co-pays or had to pay uh, the Medigap uh, premiums. Uh, the question really is, is something else going on, something more long term? And here I'm cautiously optimistic, although I wouldn't change my policy uh, prescription, which would mean that we work hard to uh, moderate the growth of uh, not only Medicare, but also of uh, employer-sponsored policies. And what's going on in my mind uh, is that for the first time in my life, I believe there is a change in the attitude of the provider community uh, that they're all talking about cost, they're all talking about this is unsustainable, they're all coming up with little ideas in their hospital, in their clinic, whatever, for ways to, to save. You know, the vast majority of them will be failures, but uh, some of them will uh, bear fruit. Uh, there's also uh, a demographic transformation going on uh, in the healthcare industry. 30% of the uh, physicians practicing now are women, 45% of the residents are women. Uh, men going into uh, medicine uh, along with women want a better balance between uh, life and work. Uh, and uh, so their attitudes, I think, about how one practices medicine and what to expect are gradually changing, uh, and uh, this is a very good thing. The complexity of medicine now, the difficulty uh, with regulation and insurance makes uh, younger physicians more willing to uh, work in organized, uh, you know, large groups or for hospitals uh, or clinics uh, where they don't have to deal with all the, the business aspects which uh, they weren't trained to deal with and they don't like doing. Uh, and so we're getting the consolidation of health care very gradually that might uh, be uh, a positive force uh, in holding down costs over, over the long run simply because we'll have a, a different organizational pattern. Then there's all these new delivery uh, systems. Uh, not the minute, the, the minute clinic, uh, I passed three between my office uh, and my home, uh, which is four miles, uh, and they didn't exist four years ago. Uh, well, now maybe that means I stop in more often, but the price per stop in is lower, and I think the product of the two uh, is lower. Uh, is this something we should uh, say, hey, problem solved, you know, let's <laughs> go on to something else? Absolutely not. Uh, I see sort of three threats here. Uh, one of them, is that uh, the consolidation that I spoke about before uh, that's occurring and will be encouraged by the Affordable Care Act uh, is giving uh, these larger institutions, the hospital that's buying the doctor's groups, the chain of uh, SNFs, whatever, 
more market power than they had before. Uh, and they could exploit that uh, to uh, try and raise prices. Uh, we uh, also have uh, the old problem, which is uh, rampant uh, technological progress, where we ask the simple question, is the new device, is the new drug, is the new intervention uh, better than the old one uh, by a tenth of one percent, even though it costs six times as much, we'll pay for it. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot going on in genomics and uh, in new uh, uh, technologies that uh, could burst out and uh, cost us a whole lot. And finally, uh, there's the Affordable Care Act implementation, and uh, it could be quite rocky. Uh, it will increase demand which uh, will uh, lead to price pressures. And so with all of this uh, sort of uncertainty, I'm, I'm sort of as cautious as I ever would not, as I ever have been, notwithstanding the fact that if you look at the CBO projection for Medicare for 2020, and you compare the, in this March report and compare it to the 2010 report, it's a 20% reduction uh, in Medicare spending which is precisely what you referred to. So there's been some very good news. We don't really understand all the factors that went into it, nor can we uh, assume that it can be sustained. Now ask them if they agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you agree with them? Do I agree? Yes, definitely. Do you want to comment? I agree. It seems to me, listen to you, that what we all ought to do is the four of us should get up and we should go immediately over to one of those minute clinics and we should all walk in and say, oh, I hope you can help us. We all, we, none of us feel well. We, we think we have a sequester. <laughs> <laughs> a malignant sequester. <laughs> a malignant sequester. <laughs> we, have time, we have time for perhaps a question or two uh, from the audience. There are microphones uh, uh, in various places. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Ma'am on the aisle here. Hi, uh, Nancy Spanis, Executive Intelligence Review. I'd like to address an element of the budget which really is, doesn't get counted, which is the bailout for, uh, which continues to go on with Wall Street. And as you probably are all aware, and what I'm mainly interested in, uh, there is a major move and has been even from people who were in favor of getting rid of Glass-Steagall back in 1999 to be in favor of its restoration because there's a danger of a hyperinflationary blowout with the quantitative easing now going on. This is an environment in which budget figuring you know, can be blown out of the water in a matter of a few minutes as you referenced in terms of potential blowouts of the economy. So there is a bill on Glass-Steagall to be renewed. There's a movement in the states. Uh, the question in my mind is uh, how you would address that question of taking, of eliminating the quantitative easing input of the federal government, which is an input of the, t potentially of the taxpayer. There's been a major discussion uh, in fact, our biggest bondholder, Mr. Pimco, has said it's a credit supernova on our horizon. We are, look, we are ignoring, we're looking at cutting things for people who need it while we're ignoring the explosion and the fact that our government is bailing out these banks that aren't lending into the economy. So could you comment? I'm tempted to say thank God for the sequester, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alice, would you like to I respectfully disagree. I, <laughs> I think uh, the Federal Reserve will have to uh, worry about how uh, to unwind the quantitative easing over time, but I see no danger of inflation exploding anytime soon. Uh, we should be so lucky. Uh, inflation happens when uh, resources are fully used, when unemployment is low. Uh, and we're up against capacity. Uh, we are in none of those situations, and I'm not worried about inflation now. 
Last one, yes, sir. Gerald Chandler, uh, you mentioned that uh, everybody that is against just about every cut that's mentioned, if we just took the 45 billion or the 85 billion or whatever and uh, had it be half tax increase, we'd still have 22 billion or 45 billion to cut. Is there anything that you can name right now that you would be willing to cut? Well, if I could just make a slight correction. The idea, uh, which the, uh, or at least the administration's position is, uh, and Alice spoke very well about this, no, we wouldn't be cutting, we shouldn't be cutting discretionary spending. We should take that off the table. We should be focusing instead where the spending problem is, which is mandatory payments or entitlements, and also add about an equal amount of revenue increases. So I think one answer to your question is we shouldn't be cutting further at all in the discretionary area because, as Alice said, it's actually, as a share of GDP, about to be at a 50-year low. Uh, now, in terms of mandatory spending, uh, and I'm going to just close the panel on this note to be on time without seeking additional commentary, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of proposals on the table. For example, means testing Medicare, uh, which I think ultimately there will be agreement on in terms of reductions. I personally think there will be. I don't know how long it will take apropos of this question of what's feasible or not feasible, but I think there will be. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, really, a wonderful job. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Donald. Thank you all.